This is an SBC Media Partners production. Swung on, hit high and deep. Right field. Right field. Right field. Right field. It is Phillies fans, these are your glove stories with Murph. Let's check in with Greg Murphy. Murph, you got a special guest, huh? Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Glove Stories with Murph. We are glad to have you with us. Of course, brought to you by the Parks Casino Sportsbook app and the great folks at Red Robin. And uh, we are really excited to bring in uh, well, an old friend, honestly, but uh, a guy that uh, has some great stories to tell about his playing days in Philadelphia. 15 seasons in the big leagues, 11 of them spent with the Philadelphia Phillies. And, uh, well, he's a fixture down at the ballpark nowadays. Uh, if you're down at Citizens Bank Park, you probably run into this man a time or two. Uh, we welcome in Greg the Bull Lazinski uh, here on the show today. Uh, Bull, thanks for being with us, first and foremost. Very good, Murph. It'd be, it uh, is, uh, good, you know, I was looking good, back. Good and, What's that? Go ahead. Go ahead. That we'll have a good session here. Absolutely we will. A bull session, if you will, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking back and uh, at, at some of the uh, highlights of your career when I was getting ready to, to sit down and, and do the prep work for this. And really, uh, there are so many different things to talk about with you. But I wanted to start uh, way back because you grew up just outside of Chicago, Illinois, a great <laughs> athletic family. Uh, yep. Sports was, was a big part of what uh, of your childhood and, 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 you know, teen years and growing up in high school and all um, and baseball and football. I mean, it really could have gone either way. What you had lots of scholarship opportunities for football coming out of high school. Did you not? Yeah, I was pretty lucky. Uh, we had uh, great athletics at the Notre Dame high school in Niles, uh, 1500 boys at that time. So we're better. And, uh, you know, I was lucky. I put, actually, I played on a football team that never lost, you know, so uh, we were, it was pretty easy to go out there a lot of times, you know, we never got the tail beat off us, but, uh, you know, uh, the baseball draft had just started years before that, a couple years or whatever, and it wasn't, uh, I don't know, it wasn't that big at that time, you know, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, my sophomore year, you might say, because I played freshman uh, varsity, uh, a lot of scouts start coming around. And then uh, by junior year, you know, there was quite a few in the stands. I mean, you know, we played in that uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania weather, you know, where it wasn't yeah. real warm, you know. So uh, we didn't get a whole lot of fans. I mean, maybe sometimes your parents were out there, but most of the time it was scouts. So, uh, you know, came to the realization that uh, after talking to a few of them that uh, I'd probably be drafted pretty high. Uh, so I uh, had to sit back and wait, but uh, went 11th in the country that year. And uh, again, like you said, I had numerous scholarships uh, to, you know, to go play football. I know uh, Eric Parsegian was at Notre Dame and I had gone there on a visit with uh, Theismann and then another guy that actually played with me and you're on South Dakota, Mickey Bowers. And uh, we were there and, uh, you know, he, he, he basically, you know, they have their list of players they want. Yeah. He said, keep a spot open for me until I made a decision. So I don't know if I would have gone there, but uh, it was uh, a little bit different at that time because you could sign, uh, what do you call it, the grants uh scholarships in, in each each conference not now you can only just sign one so you know i had signed uh with the university of kansas uh pepper rogers was there and uh a, a guy that uh, gentleman that recruited me from uh, michigan got uh, left michigan the coach there so um it was uh it was tommy in fact dick tommy and uh okay. so i was I, I signed with them, but, uh, you know, when baseball came around, uh, John Quinn was uh, the general manager, believe it or not, in 1968, and he was a tough old bird, and uh, so were the Carpenters. I mean, really wasn't, uh, really was young in the organization, and his father was still running it, so uh, I don't know. I sat down and got like a whole $65,000. <laughs> you know, and, and when you think about it, I guess uh, people say, well, back then that was a lot of money. Well, yeah, at the time, I guess, uh, perspective, it probably was. But, uh, uh, you know, nowadays, uh, obviously, everything's changed. But, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I went to the minor leagues. First minor league manager was uh, Dallas Green, reported to year on South Dakota. 
and uh, there was Big D, uh, and he had, trust me, he had plenty of time because Sylvia was still back in Delaware. Uh, <laughs> he was, she was having a baby. So, uh, you know, you thought you'd go to the ballpark, take your, you know, your rounds of hitting, feeling, and, you know, let's go to the game. But uh, we, I think because Dallas, and I think it was his first year managing too, was so pumped up. We were out there at 1 o'clock, you know, taking work, ground. Work, work. Fly ball, yeah, we were working. I said, man, this. Is, I said, uh, you know, to play baseball, we're sure doing a lot. So, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I had a friend there. Uh, I actually roomed with him, uh, Mickey Bowers. He was from uh, Quantico, and uh, Mickey was a pretty good ball player. He was a right fielder, and uh, in year on, we had uh, Wood all the way around from. Uh, and the first base to through the outfield back to third base and the uh, fly ball went up and uh, I was playing first base at the time. And I, I, I start running out there and here come Mickey. He was barreling, man. And he said, I got it. I got it. Next thing I know, he went through the wall, <laughs> right through the wall. And, I, and so I, had, I went through the wall. I said, are you all right? Yeah, I saw splinters flying. It was all over the place. He's just lucky he didn't hit be in between the two. Po he hit in between the two posts, and he didn't hit the post. Yeah, right. But, you know, Dallas kept running out, and Mickey was just laying there. You know, obviously he didn't finish the game, but uh, uh, I never. This was early too, like first couple of weeks. So I've never experienced anything like that before. When you've seen a human body go through one of those uh, wood walls. <laughs> But, but, but you're thinking, was, hey, I I pick baseball so I wouldn't have to do this kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no kidding. But uh, it was a it was a lot of fun. Dallas was Dallas. Uh, I think he went through probably 15 hats that year in in a three month <laughs> period. You know, throwing them and kicking them, and he was uh, he could put out quite a show when uh, you know when he wanted to, when he wanted to argue. So uh, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, I had, uh, we stayed in homes. Uh, right. Yeah. You're living with up, families, right? Yeah. We ended up buying a car and uh, went to the junkyard and bought a car for like, I don't know, 25 bucks. <laughs> and so, so we told that we asked the, the guy at the junkyard if he could uh, take the trunk off and he took the trunk off. We asked him to weld the seat back there and he welded a seat back there. So. The, the car, the car stayed at the, in Huron where I was, where I was living and we had stops all along the route and we jammed the back seat full and we jammed the trunk full, you know, with players. And uh, we just went through the middle of town because we had to go through the middle of town to get to the ballpark. And, you know, the, the cops never stopped us. They just waved to us, you know, so it was, it was a friendly town to play baseball, in, but uh, that's hysterical. We, we had some great experiences. Do you have any pictures of that car? No, but you know, we did sell it for more than we paid for it. <laughs> like, I think it was, you were a businessman uh, back then. <laughs> yeah, it was a relic. <laughs> that's that's hysterical you know it's i love hearing the minor league stories and now you you didn't spend a whole lot of time down in the minor leagues you know you you had a couple stops but but yeah. do you remember them finally is it was at a time uh, where you really were enjoying playing the game of baseball and hanging out with your teammates and stuff like that yeah well, it was, you know second year everybody seemed to go to spartanburg that year and uh they sent me to the carolina league so uh, it was a little different uh we played in Durham, we were based out of Durham, but we also played X amount of games in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was it was a little bit different, but uh, I don't know. I uh, I had a roommate there was a little goofy too. <laughs> uh, we were in uh, Raleigh, and uh, we game got rained out, so they had three two beer, and uh, we got into a. Uh, a, a, a dance hall or bar or whatever it was and, uh, you know we had i i don't remember getting messed up you you might say and right. ray uh my roommate he was center fielder from purdue he had the car and he says i, I said are you all right he said yeah I'm all right he took it he he went down the street and he went through a brick wall oh, <laughs> at, at, the, at the at the girls college oh my god so we go through the brick wall and there's trees on the other side and we went, but not only did we go through the wall, we went smack dab through the middle of trees. So 
I said, let's get the hell out of here, you know? So he, he tries starting the car, starting the car, and it's finally started. We backed up. And the, the guy uh, was doing the grounds, grounds work on the college because running out, stop, stop, stop. So finally, finally, he raised stop, and, and we got out of the car, ended up going to the police station. And uh, the funny thing about it, they, they were, at that time, it was so different. They were so good to us. So we, we were treated with royalty at the police station. Like, why did this guy even stop you? They could have fixed that wall, no problem. Oh my but uh, we went yeah, right. Times have the, changed. Yeah. Yeah. T- times have totally changed. But, uh, you know, you talk about experiences and looking back and, uh, you know, Carolina league was, uh, it was a good league. You know, we had good teams yeah. and then, uh, obviously Reading was my, my favorite <laughs> stop, you know, uh, it was just a fun town to play in, uh, first experience. And, uh, I know you've been there was, uh, Abraham Lincoln hotel. <laughs> yeah. Which at yeah. that time was that time was old. And uh, we, you know, we stayed there like the first couple nights and uh, at the A, but uh uh Reading was uh just just a great town. I, I lived out in Pottstown because I was married, and the hardest thing in Reading for, for players was to find some place to stay. You know, it was weird, but uh Andy Semenik was there, and uh, fortunately, I had Andy Semenik for two years as a minor league manager, and I credit him for uh, for, for for kind of the way I started to adapt to play. You know, to be tough, try to be tough out there. Uh, small injuries never bothered you. You know, Andy would just look at him and say, "Spit on it." You know, yeah, uh, that old, the old time, the old time. Uh, players so it was fun running with it. Like I said it was my my favorite town you know victory manual the uh bread pizza you know we used to go there a lot uh the willow I used to take Pete Sir I know if you remember Pete Sir he used to work in the Philly clubhouse well he was our trainer and <clears throat> he used to go do the wash for everybody you know our uniforms every night and I used to go with him and uh, the, the willow was across the street with the proprietor stanley which uh was a good 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 man and, uh, you know it's not that you had a lot of drinks that i was still young you know sure but, you know you could buy you could buy a beer for a quarter you know in all these private clubs so it was it was a little bit different but uh andy summonick like i said was a great manager um uh, it went, actually went to the playoffs and got beat by uh let's see uh, bruce keeson was on the hill Okay. And I needed a I needed a hit to win the batting title. I had to get a hit off Keith and I doubled off him. And I almost won the triple crown. I think uh, Zisk, uh, Richie Zisk, who played in the big leagues, had uh, got a homer the last day. And uh, we lost you hit, play. you hit like 33 that year, right? I yeah. was 33. Yeah. We lost, we lost to Salem three to two. It's a great game, but uh, we we lost the title there. And then Obviously went to, uh, you know, you're on South Dakota. I mean, yeah. uh, in Oregon, I was out there and it's funny because, uh, people talk, what were you doing out there? You know, years ago, farm teams were different. Now, now I kind I kind of like the idea that they did. They bring them close. Sure. So it makes they, sense. It makes sense. They're, they're, your people can go see guys play and see, you know, at a homestand there. And also, if you call people up, it's only a car drive away. So it's it's a little better than taking that red eye all the way across the country. So, But we, again, had a, a pretty good team. You know, Mike Anderson was there. We had a big team. Uh, Kogel was behind the plate. We all, we all came to the big leagues. And uh, we got recalled. But before it got recalled, Andy called or Summonek calls us in the office and says, you guys are extra hitting every day. And we go... I, I, hell, I'm hitting over 300, and uh, Mike Anders hits hitting 300. Kogel's hitting the ball good. We're going, what for? He says, well, you guys are going to go to the big leagues, and I want you to make sure you're ready. So you're hitting every day. Man, our hands, by the time we went to the big leagues, we had blisters all over. <laughs> you know, I, I said we were ready, but uh, like I said, Andy was, uh, he was good for me, real good for me. Uh, you know, you need guys like that in your career, yeah. right? Yeah. And believe it or not, Ruben Senior was uh, mm-hmm. he was he was player coach. Okay, and, and he played a few games, but most of the time he you know he was a coach. And uh, having Ruben Senior around, uh, you know, he he just had a 
his sayings and the way he talked things things were outstanding you know when, when you're around Ruben Ruben yeah. senior he's God a good, man. Him, he's a good, good man. man all right you know? where, where did the nickname bull come from because it came, I, it came at that point right I mean I'm sure you've been asked that a million times you don't know well, I went to the big leagues at 70 uh after at 19 Red, years old yes and then uh 71 so and uh, I I I think I really got it from Bill Connor, the the ex uh, yep. New York I mean uh, Daily News Daily Daily News yeah. sports writer. So that and then it stayed with me. You know everybody. Uh, my name was Bullmore and Greg. I mean nobody yeah. talked Greg. So I yeah. mean even I do a radio interview uh, saying New York and they call me Bull. So. <laughs> my first name kind of went by the wayside yeah yeah mine mine has too i'm murph uh, wherever yeah. i go you're bull wherever you go yeah i guess it, maybe it's something about that first name of ours yeah, I don't it's know. Funny. yeah it's funny. <laughs> um well it's interesting because so many uh nicknames and and great sayings have come from you know the beat writers yeah. of, of teams yeah. the, those guys are pretty darn talented and yeah and, they write uh, those stories yeah. and, you know end up calling you something so you know I don't know. Conlon was always around. I, I don't know if you know Bill. Remember sure. Bill? But I do. It yeah. seems like he you turned your back, and he'd always be there. So <laughs> yeah, he, he was a little different. He he was a little different uh, for sure, but uh, but certainly an excellent writer. Uh, it, you know, so you you come up at age nineteen, and nineteen years old in the big leagues, especially in that time, nineteen seventy, where it was you come up you don't talk, you, you, you know, you get your work in, you don't look, look anyone in the eye kind of thing. How intimidating was that for you? I, you, you only played eight games. You came up as a September call up, but yeah. I mean, even in 71, when you're back, you're, you're, you're with these guys, I would imagine somewhat intimidating, right? Well, I was lucky to be honest with you. Darren Johnson was there and uh, I knew Darren from spring training. And uh, I guess he took a liking to me because uh, when I went up, I didn't, I roomed with him. He asked, he asked, asked me to, you know, the club to let, let, let me room with him. And I did. And uh, he, he helped me out. You know, he, he talked about pitchers, starting pitchers, how they pitched them. I mean, he, he was doing the whole analytical bit before it was on paper. Right. you know about about the counts and everything and we got along real good and I, he he definitely helped me you know and uh i think by rooming with him and the way he talked took away the intimidation part of the other guys you know and and i think plus taking good batting practices you know kind of putting on a little bit of show with your power didn't hurt either i mean uh, sure. You know, these guys would look at you and go, man, this guy, this guy's got some pop. I saw him at spring training, but I didn't realize he could, he could continually, you know, drive balls out in batting practice. So it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, my first at bat was in New York and uh, Ray Sadecki was the pitcher, left-hand pitcher. I think, Christ, I think he had 14, 13 strikeouts that, that, that game. And I think I was probably number 14. <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah. he had it. He had it going that day, and he he had that down and in slider, you know, to a right hander, and he he hit spot. He hit some great spots with it, and uh, you know, it was kind of after the first bat. It was kind of like, damn, everybody's like this. I'm in trouble here. You know, <laughs> I've heard that line before from a yeah. lot of hitters. Yeah, yeah, and uh, obviously, uh, you know. I was young, you know, went, uh, I went back to uh, Eugene for a year and then came back and they told me, uh, when I came back in September, I play every day. So, you know, I did, I played first base every day and, um, they were going to try to move there in the third or left. Mm -hmm. And he was getting, you know, older in his career. So then, you know, Owens called me up, uh, that just or came downstairs just before uh, the end of the season and said, look, here's what we're doing. <clears throat> You're going to go to left field next year. You, you know, you'll hit fourth or fifth for this team. And, uh, and I said to him, I got a negotiated contract first. He said, don't worry about that. We'll tell, I'll take care of that. Cause I had to do it with John Quinn. Cause Paul was still the assistant and uh, okay. Paul had, Every, he handled everything. I said, you know, if I'm going to hit fourth or fifth on this team and I got to make a position change, you know, 
I expect, I, you know, I, I expect you guys to take care of me. And, you know, w- which, which they did. So uh, that, that's basically how I started going to left field. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. You got to be your own agent uh, back yeah. in those days. Yeah. Uh, we kind of were. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't big. I mean, actually I didn't have, I don't think I had an agent till 73, 74, somewhere in there. Yeah. You know, so what do you different. remember most? Uh, uh, so obviously you got your major league debut, then you got your first major league hit, and then you get your first major league home run. Or are, are any of those memories stick out more than than others? Yeah, a couple. You know, the first hit, first home run, dude, because the first hit was an infield hit. You know, I yeah, had you to shut up your speed. Yeah, I had to leg it out. <laughs> you know, against Carl Morton and in, uh, in Montreal, and then. Uh, the first home run, I I, I kind of used it as a, a little bit of a joke, saying I think I made a mistake when I hit my first home run, and people always say why. I said, well, it was against Reggie Cleveland from uh, St. Louis Cardinals, and I said the first home run I hit was in the red seats, so it was in the upper tank, and I said that I said I think I needed to hit the lower tank, just even a paint scraper, because I think people start expecting me to go up there all the time. Yeah. You know? And, and at that time, I was the first one to hit a upper deck home run in, in the red seats. But, uh, you know, Reggie Cleveland, I faced quite a few times. So after that, it, uh, baseball's a little different, though. You used to face pitchers more. There was less right. team. Mm-hmm. You played You played in the National League. You know, what, what we have, uh, I forget how many teams we had in a division, East and West. And... You know, you got to see people, you know, yeah, you played them. You played them multiple times. Yeah. You go to, yeah. you make your, now you make, you go to LA one time. We used to right. go twice, San Diego, all those Western clubs. We used to hit twice and, uh, you know, you'd see the pitchers more often. So you got to know, them. you know, you, 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 you got to have an idea what they're going to throw. And, uh, you know, the, the big thing challenge for me is when I went to the American league, because, you didn't see, you could go to, you could have a series and be ahead and never see their closer. Right. You know, so you could be there. I could have been there in 81 and not seen uh, Milwaukee's closer till 82. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it was, it, it was goofy as where when you play the national league, you'd see them. You, you, you couldn't just go check the iPad and, and take a look at the, what they had. No, no, we, <laughs> we didn't have them then. You know? No, you know, a little different. We, uh, we mainly went by scouting reports and uh, like when I was in the American League, uh, you know, Charlie Lau was a uh, hitting coach for Chicago and Charlie would just, I'd ask Charlie, I said, uh, just give me his out pitch, let me know and, and if uh, and how he likes to use it. You know, that that was about it. That's all. That's about all the report you could get on a yeah. pitcher like that. You know, he, he, he'll spot his fastball, but his out pitch is a breaking ball, you know, so if it's a if it's a tough situation, he's probably going to go to the breaking ball. I, I I know in the National League when when Larry Larry Bo hit eighth, I used to watch him a lot. And people say, why would you watch him? And I'm saying, well, if a pitcher's going to throw him a three two curveball, there's pretty pretty good chance I'm going to get one. You know, so I, I got that in the back of my head. You know, and well, that's it, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know if guys watch the game like that nowadays. Most yeah, I, I don't. I don't think they do, or at least not not a lot of them. Uh, do you think uh, if you if you played in this era, do you think the the amount of information that the hitters are given would help you, or do you think it might have maybe hindered you a little bit? Well, personally, I think you know, when I, even as a, I was a hitting coach, it, it started getting more analytic, and. Um, I, I didn't really want guys going in the video room, to be honest with you, because I'd say to them, what are you looking for? You know, as they go in, I said, what are you going to look at? And they'd look at you like, I'm, I'm going to watch my swing. I said, well, what part of the swing are you going to watch? Are you going to watch the positioning of your hands through, through ten at bats? Are you going to watch where your head is? Are you going to watch what your shoulders are doing? Are you watching your feet? You know, and they kind of look at you like, well, I never, I never thought about that, you know? So I, you know, I used to try to go up, make sure I go in there with them and just talk to them about things like that. But the information they get now, I think sometimes it overloads your mind. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, it, 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 it kind of like yesterday, 
the Phillies won, and then Segura's up in a situation with a man on third base, and he swings at two bad raking balls. So somewhere he got information that this guy throws a, got a good breaking ball. So what happens? He took a fastball and swung at two bad breaking balls. Yeah. You know, so th- th- that's telling me he's sitting there looking for a breaking ball. And, and, and even the pitch that uh, Real Muto hit yesterday was, uh, what, four or five inches outside. Yep. So you you know he was looking for, for breaking balls, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, you, you think about Segura uh, on this current team and w- obviously one of their better offensive players and has been all season long. But, uh, but yeah, even – even those guys can get in their own head sometime and, and overthink it a little bit. And that's a tough way to play baseball. Yeah, no question. You know, every now and then you see Harper try to do too much at bat, mm-hmm. you know, where he wants to take on, he wants to hit that ball out of the stadium instead of, you know, stay, yeah. staying within himself. And, you know, he, he, he's adjusted pretty well though, from a bat to at bat when he does that. And, uh, you know, he's the, obviously the mainstay of that ball club right now, but, there's there's times he tries to do too much and uh you know you look you look at our club and if we could get, just get some more guys hitting you know It'd hitting be okay. the yeah especially yeah. especially with runners of uh, second and third or just second we don't we don't seem to know how to drive people in anymore yeah you know it's interesting because i think as we've uh, gotten through the 2021 season and gotten close and as we sit here and tape this we're about two weeks left in the season um, but the parallels, cause I've, I've been going through the 1980 season with Larry Bowell on the podcast all year long. And, yeah. and we relive some of the games and the parallel of the two teams, there are some similarities. Now we don't know where the 2021 team is going to end, but you know, when you look at that 80 team and, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead now because, because we touched on it, but right. when you think about that 1980 team, here was a team that basically was told, look guys, one more shot all together. And, and here's your moment. And that season, albeit 162, is a long season, but it wasn't all, you know, roses for you guys. You guys struggled at times, and you, there were there were moments when you probably thought this is not going to happen for us, right? Well, yeah, it didn't happen the year before, (laughs) right? Exactly. So so they threw that in our face that we'll probably break this team up if we don't win, and. you know, it, you're right. It wasn't. You know, when you think about that season, we had to go to, into Montreal and win two out of three. Yeah. You know, and uh, you talk about big mistakes. You know, you look back at their manager, Williams, and why he pitched the Schmidt with McCormick in the on deck cir- circle is I don't think he's ever answered that question. But, <laughs> you know, there, there was some luck involved, but then he, you know, Schmidt hit the ball at the ballpark, but we had to go. And, and the one game was uh, we waited over two and a half hours or better before we could even start it. That's so right. Game it two, was yeah. tough. It, it, it's like I said about this team. And, and you look look at the Cardinals. Look at the Cardinals. Did. They ran off 10 straight right now. And look, where are they? They're four games, sit, sitting four games ahead in, in the wild card. And nobody would have thought that. And I, it was that's, that was the same approach that the Phillies needed to take against Atlanta. Atlanta wasn't playing that good, and if we could have, you know, we were at four, and then we were supposed to, we were at a, a, situ, a place where we're supposed to beat these teams. You know, they oh the schedule's easy now. The schedule's never easy because right. those guys want to beat you. They want to take you out of. Uh, uh, they want to take you away from winning a division or even competing in a division because that's a, that's all they got to do. They're they're bad teams, yeah. you know. So if whoever got even now, whoever gets in a streak from here on out, they're gonna win it. They're go- they're gonna win it, and and that's what that's the way it was for you guys in eighty in September. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the numbers in September, I, I think you started September maybe four and a half games back. Mid September, you were three and a half games back, I think on September 10th or something. And then boom, it started to click for you guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, Dallas pulling, you know, all pushing buttons left and right. And, you know, everybody's on, on each other, but some way, somehow you guys figured out ways to win. And, and what do you think was different in 80 than maybe wasn't there in 76, 77, 78 kind of thing? Well, I, I think when it, when it came down to it, is we had we had guys with 
with better years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I simple, remember yeah. I'll tell you a story about Schmidt. Uh, Schmidt was really big in that last month. I mean, he 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 was a guy that could carry a team like a Bryce Harper could carry a team. But he had people be, behind him and with him that we could chip in, you know, chip in more than say they they're doing now. But uh, I'll, I'll never forget Schmidt. Used to he was down. We all locker together down in the one corner. He was saying, you know, Dallas just came up with this this new rule. We did you hear him? In the, we had a little team meeting, and, and I said, yeah. I said, uh, he said, I have a ritual before the games. Things I do to get ready for the game. So I said, well, what are you trying to say? He said, I don't take injury. He said, but I make sure Book's out there all the time. So, you know, they don't have to say, hey, we need a third baseman. Book, Book knew that was his job, right? you know, take take infield. So Dow says to him, that's going to be, every time you don't take infield, it's 100 bucks. He tells the whole team that. So Schmitty says, I don't know what to do. I says, well, it's pretty simple, Schmitty. You got your checkbook here? He <laughs> said, yeah. I says, Take a check out, sign it, and put it on his desk. And don't take infield. Just do your own thing. And at the end of the season, see what he says. So he did. He signed a check and <laughs> left, it, left it blank and put it on his desk. And he, and he never took infield. But, it, you know, it's, it's like Pete Rose was saying. You know, we were all sitting there. He says, Shreddy, you're smoking hot right now. Don't change anything. Right. I think you're superstitious, but do your thing. Do what you've been doing. Do, do it full set. Just write the check and put it on his desk. You know, you're carrying us right now. So, you know. You Tell know me Dallas she, never cashed that check. <laughs> we never wrote it out. No. <laughs> no. Didn't have to when you're. Just goofy things. But uh, yeah. like that, he was, well, he was National League MVP, and then he went to the World Series, and it was the 80 uh World Series MVP, so sure. you, you, you know, I mean, that story writes itself. Yeah, you know, it was like you know Dallas, you know, and he, you know how he was. He was out big, loud, and you're gonna do this and that, and you know, Schmidt didn't do it, but he had a hell of a last month in the World Series. You know, it, it and it's funny because the narrative of the '80s season obviously is a is a positive one. You guys are to this day so incredibly beloved in this town, but um, it would be very different had you not won it all because of you know Dallas was he was a tough guy and you guys didn't all get along with Dallas every day. And, you know, I know, I know you had your, uh, issues w- with Dallas from time to time. I know Mike did as well. And, and it's well documented, but it's all kind of okay now because you ended up winning it all. Right. I mean, they, well, yeah, been very different. Uh, well, obviously there's no question that uh, winning uh, cures a lot of, uh, a lot of problems, but, uh, you know, uh, the funny thing is they say they, they would have broke the team up, but I don't think there's any question about that because Carpenter came out in spring training of uh, 81 and announced he's, so, he's selling a club. Yeah. So the minute, the, minute that ha- the minute that happened, you know, guys were kind of looking at each other saying, oh, man, you know, we're not used to this. You know, we're used to the Carpenter family being there, you know, running the club and I think uh, the, the, that Bill came in that was, that he was going to be kind of like a Barnum and Bailey type guy moving people because Bill Bill liked headlines yeah, yeah. and he, he liked to trade people and that's basically why uh, I asked the, you know, really if I could be moved and uh, to another ball club and uh, you know he said I'll, let me see I try to do the best I can. And uh, that's how I ended up going to Chicago. Right. But uh, I think they would have broke that team up, you know, in yeah, 1980 think, if we didn't win. Yeah. But I think you're I probably think right. The, the, not only you talk about the fans, but you t- we took the fans to the last series, you know, so they were on edge. And then you go to the playoffs in 1980. And, you know, it goes five games. Yeah. Uh, everyone's extra innings, but the first one. And another series where fans are biting their biting their nails. And then <laughs> the 
when, when you finally made it to the World Series, they were so pumped up. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, you know, the old vet being full. I mean, yeah. if you think about that, that, that was a football stadium, basically. And, and every seat in that, every seat in that place was full. So, you know, it, it, it's memorable. It's a lot of fun. We had a lot of close knit, knit guys that played together for a long time. Uh, you know, God bless Paul Owens. He brought in the right players at the right time. I mean, he traded away roof and brought them back. You know, he went out and got Maddox early and then, bring a guy like McBride in there in the outfield you know we got uh, you know speed we got power you know, our, 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 our defense was outstanding up the middle I don't think he could could find any anybody better than tree on bow and, and yeah. Schmidt over there at third on the infield and uh, you know first base you know so uh, Maddox and center McBride hell I just guarded the line <laughs> and you know what that, that that was enough right that was good enough you know yeah. it, it, are you surprised that uh, through the 70s you know that you guys didn't win another i you know you go back and you look the, the years that you had in 77 and 78 i mean were just monster years and mike was doing his thing and as you talked about the defense on this day there was so much talent and so many yep. really good you know players and and seasons that year but yet you weren't able to get you know you weren't able to get over the hump are you are you surprised that you weren't able to well i think we didn't get over the hump for a couple of reasons we made a couple of mistakes a managerial mistake um uh, you know in in some of these playoff games i know gary dropped that ball in center field in uh la which never happens mm -hmm. and then obviously everybody wanted jerry martin to be in there instead of me with and to this day, I, 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 the ball never hit the wall, it went straight up off the tip of my glove. And, you know, I threw it the, threw it the, obviously, I threw it the second, figuring I could, you know, keep them from advancing. And then the ball hits the seam and goes by Sizemore, ends up on third, you know, next play off Schmitty's glove, you know. So a lot of things Baseball. happen. Yeah. A lot of things. A lot of a lot of crazy things happened to us, and then the next day in the rain, after losing that game the night before, with Tommy John out there, you know, you, you got to give him some credit. But uh, we weren't too fired up at that point. I mean, you, you know, that was a it was kind of that false hustle, you know, because we knew we we were down. We were just ejected that uh, yeah. we played that bad, but uh, we didn't hit like we we should in those playoffs. So you you look. Against the Reds, uh, I honestly say that was our first. It was kind of like men against boys, you know, playing that big red machine. Yeah, they were a pretty good team. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then we played the Dodgers, what, a couple of times. And they had some guys with good series. They hit some home runs. I mean, I think in, in the first couple of games, there were guys hit grand slams. Yeah. You know, that's putting four on the board fast. You know, so – I. I, you know, we got ahead of them when first game out there. I can't remember the year. I hit a two run homer. I hit a two run homer off Tommy John. Schmidt, Schmidt said, what was it? I said, Schmidt, I don't know. I can't see. <laughs> I said, I'll be honest with you. It's hard. It was hard because they start there at five o'clock. Pitcher was in sun and the, uh, it was just miserable time to see. I don't know what I hit. You know, I hit a home run dead center field. And they said, what'd you hit us? I, I don't know. I just <laughs> look, I was just looking for a baseball. So it goes back to that, uh, that old theory, see the ball, hit the ball. That's right. You know, so right. at any rate, but uh, we, we should have, that's the series we screwed up there with, with, uh, what do they call it? Something Friday. Yeah. Black Friday. <laughs> Black Friday. <laughs> you know, uh, obviously yeah. I probably shouldn't have been in that game. And I was actually in the locker room uh, the, 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 when I thought Jerry Martin was going out there. And I was at, went in the locker room to change shirts. And uh, Bobby came in, Bobby Wine came in. He says, uh, get dressed, man. You're, in the, you're still in the game. And I looked at him and I said, why? I said, I said, Bobby, why? He says, well, Danny says, you, you got a chance to hit again. I said, so? 
<laughs> you know, we're win- we're winning. Yeah. You, gotta, you know, let's, he nor because he normally made that, that move. Yeah, that was the move, right? Yeah. Yeah, but he told he told me I, I had a chance, you know, to hit again, and then uh, I did. I got a chance to hit, and I got hit by a pitch. You know. <laughs> But, just uh, to finish up a great day, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. You know, we it's have, funny. Those teams, like you said, were, were teams that should have won, yeah. and we just did. The, the like I said, the Cincinnati, okay, fine, but then the, the rest of those teams, we compared so well with those ball clubs, you know. And uh, Steve Carlton pitched so well. Our bullpen was really good. I mean, when you look at our bullpen, you know, we had two we had two stoppers out there. We had, uh, you know, Ron Reed, who I give a lot of credit to for uh, setting up Tug. Yeah, and then, no doubt. When, well, then when Tug couldn't go, Ron Reed took his spot. At, you know, you know, you know, as the closer. So, uh, you know, Brewster was out there and uh, Saucier. We had a lot of the young pitchers, and you know, 1980 was uh, an injury kind of written season too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I tore a cartilage up and Lonnie Smith came up and played well. Uh, Moreland was up behind the plate for Mooney at times. Uh, we, you know, uh, Brewster, Brewster, yep. uh, not Brewster. Uh, uh, Dickie Knowles. Dickie Knowles was there and, and Bystrom comes up. Bystrom, and wins, yep. mm-hmm. he, he comes and wins five games in September. You know, you don't think those were important. Yeah. Think about that. I yeah. mean, you you know, you're in a you're in a ru- uh, run here, and you bring a rookie up, you know, and he goes five and zero oh for you. I mean, that 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 makes your farm system look pretty damn good. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know what else looks makes the farm system look pretty good when you look not only at the eighty team, but if you look at 76, 77, 70, oh, so many of you guys were homegrown guys that had come up yep. together, and I mean you know, half the roster really. And, and, the, and some of the star players, which is, is the way you have to build a baseball team. But back then it was the only way really. Well, the, the thing about that was that Boa came up, that I came up and Schmitty came up and Booney the same year, but we all played together. Yeah. You know, we, we, the instructional league is a lot different than it is when, when we played, when the instructional league was there, you sent your, you sent the guys that you thought were going to be in the big leagues. And then even some big leaguers came down, you know, maybe some pitchers came down to get, get extra innings or yep. some hitters. But, you know, since 1968, I was, I've been playing with Larry ball, you know, yeah. uh, Boop was there. Uh, I mean, there were some real good players were there that Schmidt was there, you know, so we, we at Booney, we all came up together. You know, even though we might have gone to separate leagues in the summertime that, you know, Bo would go to AAA, I'd go to double A, that type of thing. Right. But it ended up that uh, we were pretty comfortable once we start coming up playing together. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a lot of sense. And you, you kind of know each other's tendencies and you know yeah. each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses and all of that. And yeah, that, all quite- of it helps for sure. Yeah. Yep. Hey, let me ask you this. A uh, c- couple more things before I let you go, because I want—I just wanted to. You, you made four straight All Star games, and you, you were the runner-up for the MVP two seasons in a row in, in the late '70s as yep. well. I mean, you just monster seasons. But you were also, um, you know, in in terms of Major League Baseball, you were a a big personality. In fact, you won the fan voting, I think, in '78 uh, for the All Star game. Um, you know, th- you're, we're talking about big, big accomplishments. What do you remember about those all-star games? Is the first one the, the one that you remember the most? No, not really. Uh, I, sh- I should have had five. <laughs> I got a call. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what I remember the most. Sparky Anderson called me. And I think I was leading the league in home runs at the time. Okay. And Anderson calls me and says, I got to take Twitchell because he was the only guy going off our team. He said, I can't, I, I, I can't take you. I got to take a picture. He said, you should be there, but I can't take you. So that that's always kind what of. What year was that? Oh, uh, was Would right that have been first one it was. My so 75 off. or 74, I guess. 74, 74. would have been 73, yeah. 73. Okay. Uh, I didn't go and Twitch, Twitch went, but I always think of that. You know, instead of four, I should have had five. But <laughs> you know, it was a, it was a great experience. I mean, uh, 
you know, I, I walked with the bases loaded in uh, San Diego, and at that point, no one had hit a grand slam. And uh, for some reason, Danny told me that. He was coaching first base. He come walking down and told me, he said, you know, no one's ever hit a grand slam. Let it go. Let it go, you know. Don't get cheated. And I ended up walking, but I remember that. I remember I remember Yankee Stadium. And Yankee Stadium was a little bit of a story because we were always close and to go to the playoffs. And I was supposed to do a uh, Pan Am commercial for, for uh, Pan Am Airlines. So they decided uh, they wanted me to do it in Yankee Stadium. And uh, I get a call back and they said, we can't do that can't do the Pan Am commercial in Yankee Stadium. I said, why is that? They said, George won't let you. And I said, he said, was there a reason for it? And they said, yeah, George says that when you go to Yankee Stadium, there's an awe when you play in Yankee Stadium, you know? And uh, he, he's probably he's probably right. Uh, you know, you I walked sure. through what, what was in Yankee Stadium for, for the All-Star game. And, uh, came in center field and went by all the monuments and you think of all the great players uh yankees and otherwise have played in yankee stadium and uh you know but uh, i was facing uh, so so i didn't do the commercial there to end up doing it in philly so i made the all-star team go to the yankee stadium and i'm hitting fourth and i'm joe morgan's on and uh I'm, I'm in the batter's box. I'm facing uh, Jim Palmer, uh, another uh, Hall of Famer. End up hitting a, I think it was a 3 2 pitch. I fouled a few balls off, end up hitting a 3 2 pitch to right field for a home run. So it's something I always remember that sure. my first at bat after George didn't want me in there, my first <laughs> at bat at Yankee Stadium turns out to be a home run. So yeah, I'll know, show him. Uh, yeah, I, so I kind of – that's kind of a special moment for me, uh, memory-wise, as far as All-Star games go. Yeah, and, and people should remember that, you know, again, you didn't play the American League teams back then, so you didn't get an opportunity to play in Yankee Stadium uh, unless you went to an All-Star game and it was at Yankee Stadium, right? I mean, it, that's the way it, it was for National League players. Yeah, and it is kind of an eerie feeling. Like I said, when you come in center field and with all those monuments, I mean, it's the history of the game. Yeah. Yeah, you know, if if you're any kind of baseball buff or player or whatever, you're going, you're looking at these things going. This is this is where the greats play. Yeah, you know? so it, it it it. I think George is right. It is a, for some players. It is a little eerie. Yeah. You know, till you it's get cool. till you get that first of bat or a couple of bats on you know under your belt. But uh, you think I, about all those players that have stepped in that same batter, same batter's box as you are now yeah. in, and yeah, yeah, yeah. that's then pretty awesome. In 81, I had a chance to go there and I, <laughs> to, to the Yankees and uh, ended up going to the White Sox. But uh, George was on a terror then <laughs> in, uh, in 81 in spring training. And that's, uh, I, I declined going there and ended up going to the Sox. So, I don't know. I, I thought I made a great choice going to the Sox. Uh, you know, I played for Tony, Tony the yeah. Russo. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, and you were kind of back home. You back in, yeah, back he, in the roots. Tony just managed the game different. Tony Tony was like pre-analytics, but was analytic mm -hmm. in his mind. You know, he was a very intelligent, smart manager and did a lot of things that uh, would surprise you. Uh, you know, he did them off paper, you know, and uh, he was, I just enjoyed playing for him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's one of the, one of the greats for sure. Yeah. Um, Hey, before I let you go, and I'm embarrassed that I didn't know this because I should have known this about you. But again, in 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 prepping for this, you won the Roberto Clemente Award, which I I yeah. did not know. You were one of the first players to to uh, recognize the need to leave tickets for underprivileged kids, and you had the bull ring, and yeah. and it led to the Roberto Clemente Award. That that has to be a pretty special award up there on the mantle for you, right? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, you know. Roberto was uh, obviously a tremendous player, and he did a lot for people in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, and he died uh, actually the, the, in a plane crash the same way, giving, you know, yeah. take, taking stuff to poor people. But, uh, you know, when I, I signed a five-year deal, and uh, 
with with the Phillies. And part of, part of it was I said that I'd take part of that money and have have the bull ring. I think there was probably over a hundred some seats in there, and I'd do that for every home game, and then make uh, special groups that were you know came in that was mainly for for kids that never seen ball games and couldn't afford to come to a game. So I get a lot of those people, believe it or not, that come out there uh, to Bull, Bulls barbecue. Now I was going to ask you that. Yeah, you I know, bet. I bet. Yeah. They say, thank you. Uh, and I go, I saw the first game ever and it was fortunate that we got in the bull ring. Our group got in the bull ring and uh, it's the first time I was ever in a big league ballpark and yeah. things of that nature. So, you know, it, it kind of makes you feel real good, but uh, I could, I did that in Philadelphia and then continued in Chicago and, right. uh, you know, got a great spot. And, and then kind of after that, I think more players in, in Philadelphia, even, even from the football side and hockey, basketball, start getting involved in community effort, you know, and now you know how big the Phillies are now. So, uh, you know, I kind of think I was, I look at myself as one of the pioneers of, no doubt. Pioneers of uh, you know, doing community community yeah. work. Yeah, I it, you know, and if that's not a a, a message and a lesson for for everybody to learn. But when you think about ballplayers today, uh, to connect with, if you connect with one fan, a young fan, you may make them a fan for life, which is what what yeah. you're describing. Guys, well, people are coming back to of- Citizens Bank Park and and coming up to you and saying, thanks to you, you know, I'm a yeah. baseball fan for life kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, I got a lot of people that do that, you know, yeah. and uh, maybe that's one of the reasons I'm out there. I don't know, but uh, yeah. it's I, I thoroughly enjoy, you know, talking to the fans. Uh, uh, when uh, they built the ballpark, they wanted to make it fan friendly. And if you walk through Ashburn Alley and you see all the local eateries, you know, you, you, you know, it was for uh, South Philly and yeah. uh, Philly fans of, uh, you know, the city and the suburbs in New Jersey with the cheesesteaks and the chicken cheesesteaks and the uh, fry, french fries chicken and peach fries so it's i think it's a great ballpark oh, and, uh, it, it is I'm just, glad, I'm just glad to be in my little corner yeah <laughs> well and and i know the fans love that you're there and that you're a part of it you know here we are this many years later from from you being an outstanding player in the city an outstanding person in this city but you know we're so far removed but yet there you are front and center and the fans have a chance to interact with you at bulls barbecue. Um, and they love it. And and you've been a fan favorite for, you know, four or five decades now. And I know that yeah. makes you feel good, but, it, but I think, I think it's also important that there's that connection from that 1980 team to today's team. And, and you're, you are one of those major connections. Well, I think you got to thank the Phillies for letting me be there. Uh, you know, the, uh, Dave Montgomery and uh, Bucky, uh, Dave Buck, you know, uh, wanted wanted somebody that could connect with the fans, and uh, and 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 I did, uh, you know, I do love barbecue, and I have a few things out there that are mine. So, you know, it, even though Aramark runs it, it's a special place. And uh, like I said, you know, I, I, the, the funny thing about being out there, they're true Philly fans that come yeah. to see. You don't really hear any negativity from them. You know, you might. You, somebody might say, as far as being negative, what's wrong with this team? But <laughs> other than that, you, you never hear them say, oh, that guy's a bum, or what are they doing with this guy or, or that guy? You know, they're, they're all positive people, and I know that uh, we're not drawn very many people now, but the, the people that do come out there, you know, they're, they're excited. They, you know, yeah. they, they're, pulling, they're pulling for this team saying, hey, we're still in. You know, we yeah. got a chance. We're not going to be out of it till the numbers tell us we're out. Yeah, and 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 the, the another cool thing is that so are you. You know, I mean, you live and die with this team. We text uh, from time to time. You know, I know you text the guys uh, on the broadcast from time to time. You're watching every game. You're involved. You you want this team to win as much as you know the guys down in South Philadelphia just hanging out on the corner. Yeah, no question about it. Uh, you know, you pull for them. Uh, once a Philly, always a Philly, yeah. and. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I did talk to Dave Dombrowski, had a nice little chat with him. And I, 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 we were talking about what he, 
He said, what do you think's missing? And I said, I'll tell you what's missing. I said, years ago, when we played, it was the Philly way. You know, you learn to play the Philly way. And I said, that's missing. You, you never hear that anymore. You know, you never hear a player say that. You, players used to say that all the time. I said, that's one of the big things that's totally that's missing. And, 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 when, and players need to talk more, talk more about it and talk more about the, the fans. So that where the fans get involved. So that's how you bring people. That's how people are going to come out to watch you, not only by being good, but by being able to, to, to correspond with them, you know, get, get, even if you're the ninth hitter or eighth hitter on the team to where people, people enjoy watching you when you're watching the lineup and watching the team and the pitchers pitch. Connecting you know, with them. Yeah. I, I hear, I hear more about bullpen games than, I hear about anything right now, there, you know, and that goes to show you that people listen, you know, people are intelligent, you know, they're, they're good fans. They are. They are. We know that that's for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, one last thing before I let you go. And, uh, you, you know, we've talked about some of the, the great things that you were able to accomplish both, uh, professionally, uh, in your life and, and personally in your life. Um, but I think you, you would admit you, that you do have one blind spot and that was, evaluating talent in high school um you know you you had a guy that you just decided to kind of cast away from your high school at when you were a high school coach and you know he's had a scrap and and kind of you know he made it up to the big leagues anyway but you know but admit it right now here on the podcast that cutting me from the holy cross baseball team was a mistake right well it was probably the toughest thing i had to do. <laughs> you know i had you a don't lot even of remember <laughs> I don't even remember the year. <laughs> you know, though, uh, speaking about, we, we had so many kids that could play. It was unbelievable. Wow. Sure did. You know? And there, there are some kids that ended up going uh, to major colleges. And uh, Jody Hudson went to the yep. big leagues. Keith Geragos went to the big leagues. Yep. And those would have been all guys that uh, you would have been around. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Joe, Joe Hudson and I were, were classmates and, uh, and friends. Um, yeah. You know, for folks that don't know the, the running joke is that, that Greg cut me from the Holy cross baseball team when I was in high school. Uh, the, the, the best part was when I was a freshman, you, you, and this is widely known, you were my favorite player growing up. And when, when I got to high school as a freshman and a baseball sure. player, you had just moved to varsity. You'd coached the, your first year at Holy Cross. You were the freshman baseball coach, sure. and then you moved to the varsity uh, to be the head, the head coach for varsity. So sure. as a freshman, I came in thinking, oh, I'm going to get a chance to play for Greg Lozinski. And, you know, I played, I played uh, freshman. I played sophomore year. And then junior year, uh, that was it. And, but I deserve to be cut. That's, that's the, that's the point. That team went on. You guys went to the state finals, right? I, you didn't win it. Yeah. If I remember. No, correctly. we didn't win, but we, we went like two, three di different yeah. years. I, you know, I, listen, don't feel bad because when I had that sophomore group and I, I was coaching, it was my first year. Mike McKelpin was the ex coach, yep. but he was still, a, I kept him on. Right. So I said to Mike, I'm going to have to cut seniors. And he says, you're going to cut seniors. I said, yeah. I said, look, they're, they've been seeing these sophomores play there. Yeah. These sophomores are a lot better than they are. They got to realize that. So I, I called them in and I, I, I said, look, you want to stay in uniform. It's up to you, but it's your senior year. You got the, what, two months of school left. Why don't you go out and have some fun? You know, do what you want to do because you're not going to play. But right. if you want to stay in uniform, stay in uniform. And not one of them bitched or not one of them complained. They just, they knew. They knew these yeah. kids were better. You yeah, know? that was a talented group for sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, I forgive so, you for, for ending. All right. Okay. You, know, we're, you and I are good. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just want to make sure Chris is all right. <laughs> she's she's fine too <laughs> most importantly uh and on that note uh we'll we'll wrap this up uh and, yeah and give my best to gene uh, uh your much better half and uh yeah no question hopefully yeah hopefully we'll 50, see you guys soon enough 52 right? years 52 years how about yeah. that that is that yeah. is awesome another yeah. great accomplishment of yours uh yeah. probably your best <laughs> yeah 
put that number one in my book. Yeah, I think so. You better. You better. Uh, Bull, right. always great to talk to you. I we really appreciate you spending a All couple right. minutes Just with us. Hold and, uh, against me, Murph. No, nah, no. Nah, nah. Like I said, I, I I forgive you at this point. Uh, you know. All right. <laughs> Thank good. you, sure Greg Lozinski, joining us right here on Glove Stories with Murph. Uh, we got plenty more still to come, so stay with us right here. Hey everyone, Murph here, and the Park Sportsbook app is the official sportsbook partner of the real Philly sports fan. Bet on it all. Baseball, golf, MMA, and more. Live in-game play-by-play betting lets you bet while you watch. No better way to bet right now than the Park Sportsbook app. The only sportsbook app backed by the number one casino in Pennsylvania, and the only one I recommend. No one does live in-game play-by-play betting better. Bet the money line as it changes during the game on the Park Sportsbook app. Plus, bet on individual player performances. In baseball, you can bet on hits, home runs, and pitcher strikeouts every inning. How about golf? You can bet on match winners, bet on leaders after rounds, and more. New customers sign up right now and get your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use promo code ACTION. Do it now. Your first bet risk-free up to $500. Just download the app or click parkscasino.com forward slash PA and use that promo code ACTION. The website has all the details. Get game previews, podcasts, and more on Twitter at Parks Sportsbook. You must be 21 and in Pennsylvania. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade, whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go, delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. And welcome back to uh, this episode of Love Stories with Murph, brought to you by the Parks Casino Sportsbook app and the good folks at Red Robin. And we welcome in the manager of the 2008 World Series champion Phillies, Charlie Manuel, who has uh, joined us all year long and relived that magical season. And Charlie, we have arrived at September 27th, 2008. That day I know has some significance for you because... That was a day you guys were all set, ready to clinch in 2008. Do you remember that day? I remember well, uh, Greg. It's uh, you know, like I, I when I think about it, I remember a whole lot about that game, and then uh, I, I feel like it, it's uh, the end of the end, end of the game set up. It left our rotation completely prepared to go in with Hamels leading off in the playoffs and things like that, and I thought that was a big big part of our success during uh, uh you know like during the run for the world series of course yeah absolutely you know that's such an important part of it it's not something you can always plan for but if you're able to set that up and and have it work out the way that you want it's it's a huge advantage heading into the postseason all right let me set the scene because you're at citizens bank park forty five thousand plus are there now you were three and a half games back on September the 10th, trailing the Mets, but then you went on a run and you swept Milwaukee four games in a row. Then you went in and swept the Braves and you found yourselves a half a game out of first on September 19th. You won 11 of your last 15 games to set up this clinching game and the atmosphere at Citizens Bank Park that day. It was a gorgeous Saturday afternoon and uh, it was rocking, was it not? It was definitely rocking, and it, it, you and you could tell. I mean, you could sense uh, it was playoff baseball, really. I yeah. mean, it was championship baseball, and then that in the game, uh, you know, like actually, I, the game started. You know, like both pitchers, you know, like they got off to a pretty good start in the game. So you yeah. know, like it started actually with the pitchers kind of in in control early. Yeah, they really did. It was John Lannon for the Nationals. We all remember John Lannon and, of course, Jamie Moyer on the hill for you guys. And uh, they did both start out strong. We didn't get to got to the fourth inning before any kind of action really happened. Chase Utley let off the fourth with a single. It was followed by a single by Ryan Howard. Pat Burrell hit a sack fly to score uh, Utley. Shane Victorino then would single. Pedro Feliz would walk. Bases loaded. Carlos Ruiz hits a sack fly, but then Jimmy grounds out. You get two runs out of a bases-loaded situation, 
I would think at that moment, you probably thought, you probably could have gotten a lot more out of that. I remember it real well. I thought to myself, we were, we were one hit away from, you know, like a, putting a crooked yeah. number up and, you know, like, you know, like and getting off, you know, like going ahead in the game and trying to have control of the game. Really? Yeah. I remember, yes, I, I totally remember that. Yeah, two was good at that point, but uh, four would have looked a lot better, would have felt a lot better yeah. at that moment. But you only get the two, and that's fine. So top of the fifth, the Nationals, they strike right back. Roger Bernardino would single uh, with one out. John Lannon would then move him over to second. And then uh, Anderson Hernandez would double. That would score Bernardino and made it 2-1 Phillies. And not the shutdown inning you were hoping for out of Jamie Moyer at that point. Yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, but at the same time, too, we did escape that inning, you know, like without uh, Washington taking the lead and stuff. And I thought right. and, and so that was that was better than them getting ahead of us. But at the same yeah. time, too, yeah, we if, uh, uh, you know, like with our, the lead we had and, and for him to be, be able to shut them down or hold them, that was very important. Yeah, and, you know, the Nationals weren't a good team at the time, Charlie, but those are the dangerous teams at the end of the season, right? Young guys playing, uh, playing, you know, with house money at that point. They're not really uh, they're not really tight. You guys are playing for something, and sometimes that can be uh, that can be a factor. That can be a big factor. I mean, you know, like sometimes the team coming in there, you know, like they're re more relaxed and, you know, like and they're, and they're wanting to play because they're wanting to put up some numbers for the following yeah. year. And, you know, like in, in – uh, they are trying to show somebody that they're good enough to be on the team next year. Yeah. And all that. And then, and, and, and the other side of the coin is here we are, you know, like we're in a tough situation. You know, like we, uh, we're, we're trying to win uh, and go to the playoffs. And, and there's a, there's a big difference. Sometimes people don't understand that. And if, if there's pressure and everything, it's what you put on yourself and our team, I think the fact that our, uh, who we were, you know, like we, we learn to handle those kind of situations. Yeah. Most championship teams do. And that's what you got to do. All right. So bottom of the fifth, you get the run right back. Jason worth leads off the inning with a solo home run, made it three to one. You're back on top by two runs. And, you know, over the course of the season, we've talked about Jason a little bit, but he could do everything well on the field. He was really a five tool kind of guy. Was he not? Exactly. You know, like, uh, uh, you, if you stop and think about it, when when he uh, when he stayed behind the baseball, you know, like sometimes he had a tendency to stride quick and kind of get out early, but he could drag his hands and still stay alive in the major leagues and perform by hitting balls in the right field and stuff. But when he stays behind the baseball and he catches them out front, he becomes a picturesque kind of hitter. Yeah. And you know, like he had a lot of he had a lot of talent. He could run, he could throw. I mean, he 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 had the package, and you, you know, like and actually. Uh, Jason Worth with, with us, we uh, I think we've talked about him this summer some, but at the same time too, he actually learned to play baseball with the Philadelphia Phillies. I felt like you know like yeah. he, he you know like kind of turned his career around. When, you know like when he when he liked playing for us, he yeah. liked our fans and he liked our players. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, he obviously made his mark in Philadelphia, became the player that we all remember, and he went on to sign a huge contract with the Nationals, but a big part of that is what he was able to do in Philadelphia. All right, well, it would stay that way until the eighth inning, so 3-1 until the eighth. Ryan Madsen in in relief for you guys. Christian Guzman would lead off with a single, followed by a double by Ryan Zimmerman, and last thing Millage would hit a sack fly. Now it's 3-2. Madsen would get out of the rest of the inning without any more trouble. And, uh, you know, right, like we were talking about, it's a tight game. You guys are bending, but you're not breaking. But uh, it's anybody's ball game at this point, right? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, Washington just kept right on coming at us. And, yeah. and they had base runners mostly in the, in the back part of the game. They had base runners all the way up to the night, all the way up to the night, really. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you like, and, and they just couldn't get the big hit. You know, like we, we kind of held them and they couldn't get the big hit to go ahead of us. And to me, that's kind of what I saw the game. And it was close. And it was right there for both teams. You know, and if you don't win this game today, you're going to go into Sunday afternoon's game needing a win to clinch the division or there's going to be a tie at the end of the season. So, it, you know, this is big, obviously. So the, the pressure is on at this point. But once again, your offense answers back. Shane Victorino, a two-out single in the bottom of the eighth, followed by a Pedro Feliz double. Victorino scores. 
back up to, and we didn't know how important that was going to be, but always great to add runs late in the game like that. Exactly. You know, I, uh, as you and I have talked this summer, if you, you relate back our spade, uh, as Pedro Feliz, you like he's, he's cool. in the picture again, with a big, yeah. big hit, a big double, you know, like, and at the same time, we, we, we had people that come through, you know, like we picked each other up and you know, like, we played it definitely played as a team. And, 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 uh, and we kind of had that kind of, uh, uh, outlook, you know, like for about four or five years here, really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, so it would all come down to this. The crowd was so loud at Citizens Bank at this point, you could probably hear them out in Montgomery County uh, <laughs> as the Phils were looking to clinch. And in comes Brad Lidge, who had been perfect on the season. Obviously, I believe he was 40 for 40 at this moment in the season, looking for his 41st save to lock it down. Uh, he would get, get Emilio Bonificio to strike out swinging, but then he allowed a single to Bernardina. He would then walk Ryan Langerhans and allow a base hit to Anderson Hernandez that scored a run, made it four to three. Then Christian Guzman would get on base and the bases are loaded. One out, Ryan Zimmerman at the plate. It doesn't look good for the fight and fills at that point. And then probably one of the biggest double plays in franchise history. Uh, it's Rollins on his on his stomach, to flipping it up to Utley and over to Howard, and uh, and that was it. And you clinch. What do you remember about that double play? What I remember was when we had the bases loaded. Zimmerman Zimmerman is, to me has always been a clutch hitter. Always. And you know, like, and, and he usually stays in the middle of the field with guys on base, and. He actually, the ball he hit that Jimmy made a dive and stop on. He he he, he hit that ball hard. He was yeah. he was a sharp hit ground ball, and uh, when I can see Jimmy right now diving and kept getting the ball in the web of his glove and, yeah. and flipping it. And you, but the moment that he come up with the ball, I knew it was a double play because Zimmerman was not what you call a great with a you know, fast runner, but he run okay. But he was you know like, and I knew it was a double play if if Utley gets rid of the ball and throws it across the diamond. We got a double play, and that set the whole. To me, that set our whole rotation up for Hamels to start the playoffs for us, and our and from there on, our pitching stayed, you know, like stayed in order, and and, and you know, like in our bullpen was it got rest, and they were ready to go when the playoffs started. I, I I've always felt like that was a big turning point for us. Yeah. Yeah, it was such a it was such an amazing play. I mean, we've seen Jimmy make that play time and time again, but in the moment, at that moment, it was so important, and it was a it was a, a Gold Glove caliber kind of play. And of course, Jimmy makes it. The big three are involved, and you clinch and 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 the place goes nuts. Uh, Lidge is perfect through the season. Needed a little help in that game, but uh, but right. stays perfect throughout the season. It adds to the storybook of the whole 2008 season. And at this moment. You don't know whether you're going to play Milwaukee in the first round or the Dodgers in the first round. That was still being worked out in the final game of the season. Obviously, you end up playing Milwaukee and then L.A. and uh, able to get through them both. Uh, did you have a preference? Do you remember who you who you were going to play, it, whether it be the Brewers or the Dodgers? You know, like uh, if you know, uh, if you remember, like our, our, right at the end of the season, there, you know, like we we swept Milwaukee at home, yeah. yep. and uh, and I remember. Uh, we swept Milwaukee at home, and the, and the Brewers got uh, they let Ned Yost go, you know, like right at that time. Yeah. And uh, you know, like it didn't to me like uh, it didn't really matter, but uh, 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 you know, like it, as far as what I wanted, it, it didn't really matter. I felt like we had a better team than both of them, and uh, you know, like uh, I think our players. I think the year before that, when we played Colorado, it was a little bit different. You know, they yeah. they were. Hot they were things. hot <laughs> but but the, between the dodgers and the brewers at that time i don't think it really mattered yeah honestly you guys were the hot team in 08 i mean you had uh, really you know come on at the end of the season to win as i mentioned 11 of your last 15 to, to clinch and and get in so uh, you guys were probably the team that everyone was saying i don't necessarily want to uh, play those guys because they're playing good baseball right now exactly we we yeah. were playing really good at that time and, yeah. and and also it carried on into the playoffs of course certainly did and uh and that that field uh, citizens bank right. park that home field advantage for you guys yeah. was just uh outstanding and it all started on this particular saturday yeah. afternoon uh in the clinching game and it right. was awesome it was right. awesome i got one thing i want to tell you, you yeah know, like when we, when we uh when i put up the lineup up that day 
and you know, like um, Jamie Moore, your tight pitcher he is, you know, like, and they hit a lot, they used to dribble a lot of balls down third. And uh-huh. I started Greg Dobbs in the game, Rich Doobie, like uh, Dauber was not what you call a, a great defensive third baseman and stuff like that. And right. before, you know, like all season, we've been using kind of flip flopping it around. I, I started Dauber in the game and, and Doobie asked me why to start Dauber. And I told him, I want some offense. And he told me, <laughs> hey, hey, Murphy told me, he said, today's not the day we got to be thinking about offense. <laughs> <laughs> but you kept him in there? But you kept yeah. him in there. Huh? No, I, I, once we took got a lead, you know, like I, I, I defense for him. But at the same yeah. time, you know, like there's no no knock on Dauber, but, but you know, at the same time, you know, we, uh, you know, like we had some guys sitting there on the bench that was good defensive players. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Greg Dobbs uh, was a huge part of what <laughs> right. you guys did in 08. He knows that. And uh, yeah, uh, he, certainly it was, uh, yeah. it was fun to watch. So, yeah. Well, you know, the players like uh, Greg uh, Dobbs and, and Felice and those guys like that, you know, like uh, they kind of, they kind of uh, actually the way they played kind of went under the radar because, you know, like we had so our uh, our starting lineups were so big, that, you know, like the, our offense was so good. You know, like that that, that that a lot of time the guy could produce and, and get winning hits for you and really help you and 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 and, and it'll be overlooked. And yeah, uh, they, they were a huge part of our our ball club, really huge. No, a- absolutely. You go back and look at some of the big moments that the bench had in '08. I mean, it was you know time after time, and we talk about Matt right. Stairs doing what he does, yeah. and and it, it was yeah. it was such an integral part yeah. of you guys. And I, and I would yeah. imagine again, most championship teams are not getting by with. Right you know, 15, 16 guys, they're getting by yeah. with 25, 26, 27 guys. And, and that's, that's how you right. win it. Hey Murph, you know what? Uh, it gets back to uh, Gillick Stankin was the bench. He always thought about bats on the bench. And uh, a lot of times uh, right now, you know, like uh, the, the, actually the way the Phillies play, I think Grabowski thinks that, you know, like kind of the same way, you know, like, about, yeah. uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like what he what he would like to be able to put on the field for his bench and things like that. And in the National League, it's very important that you have some guys like a Miller that they have now that can come off the bench and you know, like can be a guy that can win the game for you. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, if we're looking back at this 2021 season and the guys get into the postseason, as we sit here right now, they're still uh, in the mix. If they do get in the postseason uh, and we're doing this uh, 10 years from now, we're going to be talking about big games from Ronald Torres and big games from Brad Miller. And but, yeah, because it, they, they were, they're such a big part of, uh, of what this team has been able to do. But, uh, well, you know what, Charlie? We've arrived. You <laughs> clinch it. Oh, eight. It, you're headed to the postseason. And, again, we know what happens uh, going forward. However, we might uh, revisit a couple of those postseason games in the next couple of weeks as well with Charlie Manuel. Hope you're up for that, right? You're up for that? I'm up for it. I'm up for it. <laughs> Hey, I'm up for anything you want me to do. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, we love to hear that, Charlie. And uh, look, this has been a lot of fun. A lot of fun yeah. reliving 2008. Uh, you know, it was such a special year in this city for sports fans. And uh, anytime we can talk about it, especially get, getting a chance to do it with you, um, yeah. it sure is a lot of fun. So yeah. I enjoyed uh, it. And, and of course, you know, like I, I love to, to talk about, uh, I, I love to talk about the past. I love to talk about the future. And I like uh, definitely to uh, see our ballpark full. And you like, yes. and hopefully, you know, like we can uh, do it again. Yeah, yeah. hopefully we can. It, uh, hopefully it's just right around the corner. That's that's yeah. the, the the goal for sure. Charlie Manuel joining us to relive the 2008 season. Charlie, we'll see you soon here on Glove Stories, okay? Right. Thanks, Murph. Glove Stories with Murph is brought to you by Red Robin. Whether you're hungry for a juicy gourmet burger with bottomless steak fries and an ice cold beer, or a crispy chicken tender salad and freckled lemonade. Whatever you crave, there's something for everyone at Red Robin. So dine in or order curbside to go, delivery or catering. Order online now at order.redrobinpa.com. Glove Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app. New users download an app store or click parkscasino.com slash PA and use the promo code MONEY for first bet risk-free up to $500. 
Must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Love Stories with Murph is presented by Parks Casino Sportsbook app and Red Robin and is a production of SBC Media Partners. The engineer for Glove Stories is Chad Evans. Cindy Webster is our marketing and guest relations director, and our executive producer is Roger Haddon. Whether you are watching us on YouTube or downloading the podcast from one of our major podcast providers like Apple, Google, or Spotify, make sure to hit like and subscribe so that we can let you know when a new episode of Glove Stories is available. We'll release new episodes weekly throughout the 2021 Major League Baseball season.